Bitte. Good afternoon, everyone. Mr. President, Rector Magnificus, thank you so much for inviting me uh, to speak today at the university. I'm really honored. Um, I'm looking forward also to uh, the proceedings and to the interactions. Um, mayors, uh, commissioner, the other commissioner in the room, um, I specifically want very briefly to, to address uh, the mayor of Enschede and thank him for um, hosting me here today. And I've been in politics longer than the students in this room have been alive, um, more than a quarter of a century. And one memory in that quarter of a century that really stands out uh, is something that happened in this city this month exactly 23 years ago. When tragedy struck and this horrible explosion, many people died. And we were all, I was a member of parliament at the time, literally shell-shocked in The Hague and scrambling to find ways of coming to uh, the rescue if we could. And then we, in the months that followed, were amazed by the civic sense of the citizens of Enschede who stood together, who made sure nobody fell through the cracks, who offered comfort and solidarity. And if you go to the tragic place where it happened today, you see a vibrant city, a beautiful city, a city that has completely recovered. So it is a testimony to the vibrancy of this community. And uh, I think uh, the rest of the Netherlands admires Enschede for what it has done. So it's not just the university that requires admiration, it's also the community uh, of Enschede. Today, Another remark I want to make before, before uh, starting with the points I'd like to make to you today is about internationalization of education. This is one of the most important things for Dutch education. I would say at all levels. Internationalization helps universities prepare for the future in a very resilient way. Why? There is too much of a perception in the Netherlands, oh, we get people from all over the world and we give them our stuff and they take it away. That's penny wise, pound foolish. The cost of internationalization is only a fraction of the added value of inter internationalization to Dutch society. You have no idea. The challenges we face in our society today are challenges we've never seen before, but are very familiar to many people living to the south of the Netherlands and people who grew up in those societies bring that knowledge and that attitude to the Netherlands when they come and study here. So what we do is literally cross-fertilization of ideas. Uh, so my appeal is to you, don't give this up. Stand up to those who want to reduce this, be vocal about it and demonstrate to the Dutch population that it is of huge added value to uh, our society. Then, of course, I'm also speaking to you in English, which is also a bone of contention sometimes. Why are they speaking English? The problem with our Dutch language is not the fact that in higher education we use English as a lingua franca. It's that we neglect educating our children at very early age to speak and read and listen to Dutch very well. If you are proficient at an early age in your mother tongue, because you're read to, because you're encouraged to read, because you're well educated, learning other languages is just an extra for you. And it will not weaken your knowledge of Dutch. Actually, as somebody with some experience in this area, it will strengthen your knowledge of Dutch and it will strengthen especially your love of Dutch. So don't let people tell you that speaking English is bad for Dutch. Not having decent education at early age is bad for Dutch. Not reading to your kids when they're small is bad for Dutch. Not having a conversation every time at the dinner table is bad for Dutch. Speaking English at university is not bad for Dutch. And by the way, this is the first time in human history, and then I'll end on this point, 
that we have a lingua franca that is not just for the elites. The first time in human history that we have a global lingua franca that transcends societal layers, thanks to uh, the internet, thanks to other developments, thanks to the predominance of Anglo-Saxon culture, English is an instrument for all. And this is the first time uh, in human history that we have a true lingua franca for all bad English. <laughs> Thank you. The main, the main subject of my intervention today is time. I want to talk to you about time. A year ago, a bit more than a year ago, I had to go to Egypt uh, to prepare for the uh, COP conference, the uh, UN summit on uh, climate change that took place last year in Egypt, in Sharm el-Sheikh, and I had to prepare it with the Egyptian government. We had to go to Cairo, and at one point before going back, we had a couple of hours before the flight, and the embassy took us to the pyramids. And I can tell you, this for me was, was I was awestruck. And I was thinking back of my own education, and I remember Herodotus uh, describing his visits to the pyramids and describing how they were built and describing how many years it took, 20 years, and all sorts of things. He wrote about this, and I was thinking, oh my God, Herodotus was here 2,500 years ago. And then I thought, when he was here, the pyramids had been here already 2,500 years ago. So he was describing a situation that had been there for 2,500 years. Uh, why did he describe it? He used the pyramids. By the way, pyramid comes from the Greek, and it means something like a sugar cake, because it looked like the uh, sugar cakes the Greek, Greeks ate. But he described it to show the continuity of human ingenuity, but also to contrast what the Egyptians had done with his own people, the Greeks, while well, he was from Bodrum, he, today he might have been a Turk, but he was from Bodrum, but to, to, to confront the Greeks who were very um, Hellenocentric in their perception of the world with other cultures and to tell them there's more than just us. And the time is a factor of importance in uh, our development. There is a, a, a British professor, Peter Frankopan, who has written a book recently, and I would recommend you to read it. Uh, it's fascinating uh, to read it. It's called The Earth Transformed. And in The Earth Transformed, he points through human history to factors of climate change and what that does to our history. And then he shows clearly that there's, ma there's been many, many moments of transformation caused by climate changing, but always very slowly. But you had a mini ice age, which led, which led to um, uh, migrations. You had the big migrations coming from the Volga Basin to the rest of Europe. That gave many of the peoples of Europe today, which were a consequence of climate change and harvests failing, or uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and he points to wars that were caused by this climate change. But then he comes to the conclusion, now things are happening on steroids, they're happening so much faster than ever before. And now for the first time, we are absolutely convinced that it is caused by human behavior. But the point he's making is not that difference, but the similarities. Namely, it will profoundly change our societies. If it did, with the slow burning, slow going climate changes, it will certainly do it when it happens so fast and is so profound, and he also concludes that we are the first species in the history of this planet that is able to destroy itself, unless we change our behavior. There was a marvelous exhibition in the National Museum of Natural History in Washington, which my team and I visited, uh, I think, a year and a half, two years ago, where the Natural History Museum wanted to demonstrate the six rounds of extinction that the planet has seen. Well, we're in the six now, but the five previous. And it's a lesson in modesty to go there and to see that the planet can rid itself 
of almost all living beings if that, those living beings no longer fit the climate that the, the, the planet, planet produces. And I think this is important to understand that this is not about saving the climate or the planet. Because the planet has done very, very well when we were not around yet. And if we spoil things for ourselves, it's going to be perfectly fine without us. This is about saving humanity. And this should be the starting position of any discussion on uh, the climate crisis. Now, time since Herodotus has accelerated. And especially since the first Industrial Revolution, time has accelerated exponentially. And our concept of time has also changed. Um, we are a generation or a people or a civilization based on the need for instant gratification. It only takes us, let's take ourselves back a thousand years or a bit more. We built cathedrals. And those who built cathedrals, when they started building cathedrals, never ever assumed they would see the cathedral finished. Can you imagine in our culture and society we would start building something, never ever assuming to see the thing finished? We have lost the capacity to think ahead more than a couple of years, let alone a couple of uh, generations. Now, I've been looking in the past, in my very personal way now, in an effort to try and understand better where we are today. And of course, historians study the past not for the past's sake, but to find interpretations so that we would avoid the mistakes of the past and see where the future might uh, uh, take us. But what about looking into the future? Um, the one European time traveler I know best um, is Doctor Who. Um, and do there's an episode in Doctor Who where he uh, goes and sees uh, Vincent van Gogh in the last months of his life. And Vincent is deeply depressed and Doctor Who is very worried that Vincent might harm himself. Well, there's one thing Doctor Who could not avoid, but um, he then says, but Vincent, in the future, your paintings will be revered as some of the best paintings ever produced by a human being. And he doesn't believe it. So he says, get into my phone booth, we'll go there. And he takes him to today's Musée d'Orsay. And then Vincent sees how his paintings are appreciated and it validates his life. Now, it would be useful if we had that phone booth here and we could go into the future and look into the future, but we don't have that. What we do have is technical universities who are looking into the future on a daily basis based on what they're inventing and based on what they think would be the inventions of the future and how they would prepare for that. So looking into the future from a technological point of view is not difficult. What I find far more difficult is the question, do we really want to look into the future. So the question is more of ethics or morality, I would like to ask. Technologically, it is possible to look into the future with greater precision and uh, artificial intelligence is only going to make it easier for us to do so. But do we want to look into the future? I sometimes believe that we are rather comfortable living in a permanent Groundhog Day. Um, and there is too much going around in our society of people believing that if we just don't, don't look into the future, don't look now, everything will stay the same. But if there's one conclusion you need to help me with, bring to the public at large, is that doing nothing will just mean decline and more problems and more costly solutions. Think this is, should be the core of politics uh, uh, today. Um, I can't help myself, but I have to quote Shakespeare on this in, in Julius Caesar, where Brutus at some point says, and I quote, there is a tide in the affairs of men which, taken at the flood, leads on to fortune. Omitted, all the voyage of their life 
is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. We are now on such a sea, and if we avoid taking the current, we will be lost and stuck in miseries. This is my profound belief, and I hope you will help me convince others of this clear uh, fact. Now, what is our strongest, our best asset in this profound transformation that we need? Our greatest asset is the human capacity for invention. I remember uh, one of my people I admired, and I'm honored to call him uh, my uh, friend, uh, Shimon Peres, once told me, you know, human invention is a result of curiosity and dissatisfaction. You don't like the things that are, you're curious about something better and you start inventing something better. I think that's probably the basis of academia, dissatisfaction and curiosity, and then leading to a new invention. And we need to not just be dissatisfied and fear the future, we need to be dissatisfied but curious about the solutions uh, we uh, can find. So I think human invention is our strongest asset. What is our strongest weakness? I refer to it already, being locked into the here and now. Um, there is um, uh, a, a wonderful concept that was developed by another British professor with a name coming from the Balkans, Roman Krzanic, who uh, causes the good ancestor. What is a good ancestor? We, in our cultures, Eastern cultures, African cultures, European cultures, we want to honor our ancestors uh, by living well or by following their lead or their morals or transforming their morals, modernizing them. That's what we want to do. But what if we saw ourselves as ancestors and we would like to be good ancestors for the generations that come after us? We don't ever look at society like that. And I believe today's fundamental task is for us to agree that we should be good ancestors. As the, as the, the choir has sung, because vita nostra brevis est. Good, what is being a good ancestor? That is making choices differently across the planet. If I'm from India, being a good ancestor is to say, I want my kids and grandkids to live like Europeans are living today. If I'm Dutch or European, I think it would already be very good to be a good ancestor and say, I want our kids to, leave, to live at least as well as we do. Because I believe if we have that goal, and those in the world that are still a long way from that goal have the same goal, we can fix it if we have the capacity to transform our society in a uh, sustainable uh, society. So, the Green Deal. Finally, I get to the Green Deal. <laughs> Again, this is about timelines. It was not all too surprising that it was not very difficult for us to agree on a goal on 2050. Climate trial 2050, oh yeah, good idea. 2050, who cares, so, so long away. It already became more difficult uh, when we said, well, but what about reducing our emissions with at least 55% by 2030? What? wait a minute, that's seven years from now. Uh, oops. So if we want to take our role as good ancestors seriously, formulating a goal for 2050 is not enough. What we need to do is to sketch a path step by step that will take us to 2050 in a realistic and feasible way. And that is what the European Green Deal uh, does. It does help us to transform our fossil fuel based economy into a fossil free economy. It does help us create a circular economy. It does create more justice across the planet. But the fundamental question we need to answer in all of this, because we are faced with a climate crisis, with a biodiversity crisis we don't talk about enough, but which is just as threatening to the survival of humanity, 
we are in the middle of an industrial revolution which is just as profoundly transformative as the first industrial revolution, but now happens on the whole planet at the same time. We are in fundamentally changing geopolitical relationships. When we want all of that to be mastered and molded into a livable, prosperous planet of the future, in other words, if we want to be good ancestors, we have to start changing now. And we have to demonstrate... And the willingness to change now is absent if people don't see any benefits for themselves in it. But let's try and define benefits for a moment. Is the benefit that I have more income, that I have an, an, an extra car, that I, etc., etc., or could we also see merit and benefit and beauty in saying, I'm taking one or two steps back so that my kids and grandkids can jump forward. I find profound beauty in the idea that we, as a community and our generations, could do something meaningful for those coming after us, even if it means stepping back one or two steps to do that. And what I find inspiring is that the students here in the room, wherever I go, any university I visit, everywhere I speak, now I have to, <laughs> it's a bit dangerous, but I have to tell you something of a university that gave me a, a, an honorary doctorate, which it's located in Delft, yeah. <laughs> and at that ceremony, I spoke to the professors of my age, early 60s, and I asked them, what has changed? And they said, what has changed is, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, my students wanted to get a good education, so they get a good job at Shell, they get buy a nice car, a nice home, and now my students want to find solutions to the climate crisis, they want to have startups, they want to find uh, uh, colleagues uh, with whom they can find uh, uh, new ways of solving things. They're so idealistic, so focused. Why don't we see it? I think we don't see it because this is an idealism that is not rooted in ideology. We, my generation can no longer say, well, this is social democrat or liberal or whatever, or green. That's not the inspiration. The inspiration is the willingness to create a livable future, a sustainable society. And those young people, you know, how did we educate them? We were educated by our parents saying, you know, we suffered end of the war, difficult years, take good care of yourselves. Take good care of yourselves. And then we started educating our children by saying, take good care of us. And they listened well. <laughs> but it's time in our lives that we start taking good care of our children and grandchildren. Now. Because they deserve it. Because they are focused on this positive change. And that's, those are the moments when I see that generation. I'm very, sometimes very angry at my own generation and myself for the, all the mistakes we've made. But when I see those young people making those choices, wanting really this positive change, I also think, eh, some things we did quite well in educating them in that direction. But we need to help them understand that they should be tougher with us, stricter with us in fostering this change. Now, let me end, because I have to end, on something where perhaps not everyone will agree, especially with the students, but I believe passionately in this. If we are to succeed, we do not have the luxury of leaving anybody behind. Which means, dear students, that you cannot exclude people who play a role in this, whether it's the fossil fuel industry or others, you should make them change, force them to change. By excluding them, you will not help them change. And secondly, far more importantly, do not exclude people from a dialogue because their opinions are uncomfortable or despicable or rejectable. Because if you exclude them because of their opinions, you're not saying your opinion is despicable, you're saying you are despicable. And that's how it is perceived. 
And that will never help us solve problems in our society. Please rediscover the noble art of disagreeing well. Never exclude uncomfortable opinions. A university should be a place where any opinion can be studied, judged, embraced, or rejected, but not out of hand, after studying, after debate, after looking into it. This will give you the moral authority to speak up against those who deny climate change. It will give you the moral authority to speak up against those who'd rather be locked in the today than embrace the tomorrow. It will give you the moral authority to take us along into a better future. Never give up. Persist. And with the Mandalorian, I would like to say, this is the way. Thank you.